Welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining us for the First Breath and Beyond Preventive Care for Young Puppies. My name is Shelly. I am the content manager for Revival Animal Health, and today we have Revival's Director of Veterinary Services, Dr. Marty Greer, joining us. Thanks for joining us today, Dr. Greer. Oh, I'm happy to be here. And we are going to go through a lot of material. I always have a pretty dense amount of material. But if there are some sections that we get into, such as tube feeding or parasite control or any of those things that you feel like um, we're not in depth enough for you, there probably was already a webinar uh, on it. And if not, we can do one coming up. But we do have handouts from those. We do have those webinars in our learning center. So please don't hesitate to hop in there and see what we have for materials to help you out. So today we're going to talk about preventive care for our puppies. So I'm going to ask you, can you prevent diarrhea in your puppies? Not treat it once it happens, but what tools do you have that you know are going to help you prevent diarrhea at that important time when they're being weaned, when they're getting ready to leave your home and move into their new homes? Those are all really critical times for our puppies to be fragile in their GI tract and some of the other aspects of their health. So what can you do to prevent diarrhea? And what can we do to help our neonates move into new homes so that they are healthy, so that they don't end up sick? We've already done one webinar on the social skills, which was our second one of the series. So today we're going to talk about early supportive care of nutrition, eliminations and probiotics, keeping our puppies warm, nutrition at weaning, the importance of water, parasite control, vaccines and nomograms, hygiene and elimination training. So we've got some pretty fun stuff to cover today. So it's really important that remember that our neonatal health is really dependent on a whole number of factors. And really, I think the arrows, this is a diagram that came from NeoCare, but I think the arrow should actually point in instead of out, but this is their diagram. So we're going to take our advantage of that. So we're going to look at the, um, the dam, her age and her vaccination status, her nutritional status. Uh, all those things really play a role, how the pregnancy went, how parturition went, which is the actual birth of the puppies. That's the whelping. Did they get colostrum? What was the quality of the colostrum? What is their nutrition once we stop having them nurse and have them in uh, their own diet? And then what's the environment uh, play a role in? So these are really important things that all play a role in our puppies. So NeoCare, which I mentioned, these are where a lot of our numbers have come from is at the veterinary school in, in Toulouse, which is in the south of France. It sounds like a pretty tough place to go to vet school. I wish I'd gone there. I went to Iowa State. Um, so they have 700 veterinary students, 280 employees on campus. They did uh, work with 12,000 canine consultations on their campus that uh, in this one particular year, they've published 125 research papers. They have 26 American and European board certified specialists in reproduction and neonatal care. So it's really important for us to know that these numbers are hardcore numbers. They spent 10 months with these students and these uh, graduates visiting kennels in breeding kennels in the South of France. They looked at 726 puppies, 216 dams, 20 breeds. They took 4,801 weight measurements and did 15,674 clinical parameters. So really a lot of information. So the information I'm sharing here today with numbers are not things that I've experienced myself or things that I've just kind of come up with this number arbitrarily, but really rather that there's great data for us to see what these um, studies have shown. So neonatal outcomes, again, really, um, we have three places along the way that we can see puppies fall out. We can see puppies that are stillborn. If they've, if they've gotten that far and they haven't had a resorption, they can be born as stillbirth puppies. We can see them with neonatal mortality in the first 21 days, um, particularly in the first two days. That's when our puppies are the most fragile. And then we have the early pediatric mortality, which it really drops off considerably, but still all along the way, we have these risk periods for puppies to pass through. So we're going to talk about how we get there. And it's important that you're keeping close track of your puppies when you are doing your whelpings and when you're raising them. Some females do a great job. You kind of peek in there a couple times a day. Everything looks like it's going well. But there are some bitches that need additional help. We've got a couple of them that have been in this week where things haven't exactly gone just as easily as we would have hoped for. So this is important data for you to collect, not only for yourselves to monitor your puppies to see how they're doing, but also if you call for veterinary assistance that you can take along this information and you can share this with the vet tech, with the veterinarian, with the veterinary team to say, 
my puppies aren't gaining weight. My puppy's temperatures aren't right. The puppy's urine color is too dark and they're dehydrated. All these things are really important. So I think it's a really good idea for you to identify puppies by some system. If you put a color uh, system together, that's fine. If you prefer other systems, that's fine. If you have puppies that have markings, sometimes that's all it takes. But if you have black lab litter or a Samoyed litter, it's pretty hard to tell one puppy from the next. So some system for you to keep track of who is who is always a good idea. Now, some people get pretty sophisticated and they put this on an Excel spreadsheet. Other people just use a piece of notebook paper and that's fine. I'm not picky, but having those idea of weights and trends and temperatures and urine color are all really critical. Those are the th really the three things we can measure. So we have a pretty good idea of how our puppies are doing. So this is an example of a graph that was provided to me a long time ago. I've got more recent graphs that are really great as well, showing us you know, puppies that are at risk in red and puppies that are doing great in green and puppies somewhere in the middle are in yellow. So we have a lot of different ways we can graph this, but this gives you a pretty good idea that puppy number, um, well, puppy number seven and um, puppy, the yellow puppy and the white puppy weren't doing well. So very early, this owner was able to pick up that he had some problems with these puppies. They were, they started off as low birth weight puppies, and then they still continued to lag behind. So we were able to intervene on this litter when they were a few days old and start helping people with getting these puppies, the support that they need. So early supportive care is really essential. When you have these big litters, this is one of my litters that we had 10 puppies in. Uh, this was not Photoshop. This is actually one image. Uh, getting 10 corgi puppies to be in the same place at the same time you can imagine was a little bit of a trick. But we know with larger litter sizes, uh, because the litter is larger, that we have a fourfold increased risk of neonatal death. We see smaller puppies, so low birth weight puppies. We see slower delivery because of the length of time, this particular litter was born by C-section. But if you were to whelp a litter of this size, you're going to have slower delivery, meaning that some of these puppies toward the end are going to have oxygen deprivation. So it's important that you know that your puppies in large litters are at increased risk of being lost. So that's why we schedule C-sections. That's why we do supportive care. And we're going to talk about those things. And we know our low birth weight puppies have an 81% greater chance of death in the 48, first 48 hours because of their size, because they're small, because they don't have the resources when they're born, when they're tiny puppies, instead of being larger puppies. And puppies that are in the smallest 25% of their breed by the typical weight have an increased risk of mortality. So those, again, are numbers that came from NeoCare. And then we used to say puppies could lose up to 10% of their body weight in the first day or two, and they'd be okay. But NeoCare study showed us that if they lose more than 4% of their body weight, that they have an eightfold increased risk of death. So these are really important numbers. So what do we do about this? What do we do because we have these small puppies? Well, we know that these low birth weight puppies have this much higher risk of mortality. So we need to be supportive of these puppies from very early on. So our support is tube feeding and bottle feeding. And for a lot of people, tube feeding makes them very nervous, really anxious about this. So I want you to have the support that you need to make sure that you have the ability to do so. So bottle feeding and tube feeding are the safest. Makeup sponge feeding has a lot of risks associated with it. The puppies can suck in a lot of air. They can get pieces of this sponge or fibers of this sponge off. We have no way to measure how much they get. Uh, if their tummies are filled with air, they're not going to get the formula. There's no way to clean these or adequately sterilize them. I worry about the petroleum base in there. There's just a lot of things that we're concerned about when we're doing makeup sponge feeding. So this is not recommended by any of the veterinarians that I know that do reproduction. But I want you to know that nobody should starve under my roof. My husband is pretty good documentation that I don't let anybody starve. He's pretty well fed. So we want to do the same for our little dogs. So what can we do? Well, first, do I need to supplement feed? And that's a question that a lot of people have because they're concerned if they start supplement either with a bottle or with a tube that you're gonna suppress the puppy's ability or interest in nursing. And I'm gonna tell you that they won't. You can tube feed a puppy to the stomach capacity that we can calculate. You put that puppy down and it's gonna crawl right back over to mom and start trying to nurse again. That does not suppress it. For any of those who have ever been to a Thanksgiving meal or any other holiday where the food comes out and you put more on your plate than you should, but you manage to eat it anyway. And then somehow you still stand up and go over and get that piece of pie or some ice cream afterwards. You all know that being full doesn't necessarily mean that you're not going to continue to eat. So we're not suppressing their ability to nurse or their interest in nursing. Puppies should gain weight at a two to four grams per day per kilogram of anticipated adult body weight. So if you know that your dog typically weighs 66 pounds, that's going to be a 30 kilogram dog. 
So that means that that dog should gain 60 to 120 grams per day. So you can calculate this based on whatever breed you have. If you have a Great Dane, if you have a Chihuahua, you can use those numbers to help you calculate how much they should be gaining a day. And again, I'm going to reemphasize that losing more than 4% of their body weight in the first 24 hours puts them at increased risk. And puppies should double their birth weight in the first seven to 10 days after birth. So our low birth weight puppies, we know have a poor prognosis, but we know our toy breeds are going to be 100 to 200 grams at birth. Our large breeds, which are the Golden Retrievers Labs, they're going to weigh about 400 to 500 grams. That's around a pound, 454 grams in a pound. And our giant breeds are going to be over a pound, a pound and a quarter to a pound and a half. Those are typical weights. And if we have puppies that are in a smaller category than that, then we absolutely need to be supplementing these puppies with some kind of nutritional supplement. And we know colostrum is absolutely essential for good health. Now in dogs, they only receive about 10% of the antibodies that they need through the placenta. The other 90% come through colostrum. So again, it's really essential that we get our puppies to get some nursing in the first 12 hours. And it's different than humans. So we can't apply some of the things that we know to humans to dogs because the number of antibodies that pass through the maternal blood into the puppies is different than it is on people. And we know that after the first 12 to 24 hours, that that passive immunity, the colostrum no longer gets absorbed through the intestinal tract, that the intestinal barriers change in the first 12 to 24 hours. So those bigger molecules that are antibodies can no longer get through. So you can give plasma orally in the first 12 hours, you can get colostrum orally in the first 12 hours, but by the 24th hour, those antibodies are no longer going to pass through the intestinal wall. And we know that there's a huge correlation between early growth rate and the amount of IgG or antibodies that they ingest. So again, this is a graph from NeoCare that shows us the importance of that early ability to get in colostrum or antibodies. And we also need to make sure that before we feed our puppies that their temperature is warm enough that they don't have a problem with taking any feedings either by ingestion by nursing or with a feeding tube or bottle. So puppies that are too chilled cannot digest their food. They will stop suckling. If you do feed them, then the food will sit in their stomach and foam up, and then they may risk out um, aspiration. Now, this number is in centigrade because these are numbers from our friends in uh, France. But basically, our rectal temperature should be between 96 and 98 degrees rectally on our puppies before we tube feed or bottle feed them. Now, if they have a strong suckling reflex, great, go for it. You can use the Miracle Nipple. You can use a Medi Nurser. Uh, puppy Warmer can uh, send in at Puppy Warmer is just tooling up to start making these really lovely silicone nipples out of food grade silicone. So if you're using other nipples, ask if they're food grade silicone. Many of them are not. So he is just getting his equipment installed to start producing the nipples in the quantity that we're going to need as breeders. And he has them in a couple of different sizes. I just sent two of these out the door this morning. They're really soft. They feel just like mom. And they're really easy for the puppies to take uh, formula through if they're strong enough to suckle. But you don't want to just put the formula down with the with an eyedropper or with forcing it because if the puppies don't swallow it, they may run the risk of aspiration. So this is where we get to tube feeding. And tube feeding, it's important that everyone knows how to effectively tube feed their puppies. There are five Ps to safe tube feeding. One is to pre-measure the tube from the tip of the nose to the last rib. If you put the tube in that far, then we know we're in the stomach because the um, stomach is right at the end of that tube at the rib. Number two is we want to make sure our puppies and our formula are warm. I just use my wrist for figuring out if the formula is warm enough. I don't put a thermometer in it. Use your wrist like we did in the old days and make sure the puppy's rectal temperature is at least 96 degrees. When you pass the feeding tube, you want to pass with the chin down and pass it to the left side, the puppy's left side. And most importantly, before you feed this puppy, you pinch their tail or their toes and make sure that the puppy can cry. If the puppy can cry, you are in the esophagus. That's good. If the puppy can't cry, you might be in the trachea, the windpipe. So don't feed, pull the tube out, start over. And just remember, on occasion, we will have accidents that happen with tube feeding and we can lose a puppy to it. But your risks are much greater of having a puppy starve to death than a risk of having a puppy aspirate. So you will lose more puppies to starvation than you will to a tube feeding accident. So be brave and learn how to tube feed. So how much do we feed? Well, we can feed one cc per one ounce of body weight. That's the stomach capacity every three to four hours. Now, a puppy that takes a bottle may take more than that because as they suckle, 
the stomach expands so they can actually take more than if you tube feed. But if tube feeding is your only option because the puppy won't take a bottle, then tube feeding is better than not doing anything. You can feed every three to four hours with this amount, and this is a safe amount for a puppy to take in. So how do we do this? Well, I'm going to show you that we have these videos, oh, and we I'm do sorry. have the video on Revival Animal Health Learning Center. So this is a little Rottweiler puppy that came to the practice. These exact videos are on our learning center. This is a little guy who came to us. There were two boys in the litter. Um, this guy was not thriving. The other puppy was. So failure to thrive was this puppy's presenting concern. And I'm showing here the client how to pass the feeding tube. So I pass the feeding tube chin down to the left, and then I'm going to hold the tube in my left hand and then feed with my right hand. Now, in this particular case, I didn't feed the puppy because I know how to tube feed. So I pulled the feeding tube and asked the client to go ahead and pass it herself. And then this is the same puppy with her feeding the puppy. And again, we've got a demonstration here of how this works. You can hear the puppy vocalizing. So that's a good thing. You're in the right spot. If the puppy can't cry, you could be in their trachea. If the puppy can cry, you are in their esophagus. It is okay to feed. Now she's holding the tube and you can see the puppy's champing a little bit. That's normal behavior. Sometimes the puppy needs with their feet. Sometimes they champ the tube. Sometimes the tube moves out just a smidge. So that's why you want to hold it in your opposite hand. So I'm going to remind you that it's really important that we are successful in learning how to tube feed. This is one of my friends that drove from Iowa to Wisconsin to have a C-section done. And before we let her leave, she was very excited that she learned how to tube feed. And it, it's a big deal. It's a very big deal to learn how to tube feed. So getting back to our little Rottweiler story, there were the two boys in the litter. The one was failing to thrive. The other one was doing great. So I had her bring the female in. We took some colostrum from her, but you can use formula. Tube fed this puppy. And these are the puppies when they're six weeks old. And I'm just going to challenge you to say, you probably can't tell which puppy was the little puppy that was struggling and which was the normal puppy, because at this point, they both look pretty much the same. This is mother and daughter holding the puppies. So once we got this guy a little bit more grown up, he turned into this. So at nine months of age, this guy went best puppy in show at our local Fond du Lac dog show. And I think that's pretty exciting for us to say that we should not throw away the runt puppy. This puppy had nothing wrong with him other than he didn't have the ability to nurse effectively. And I think throwing away the runt puppy just because we're afraid to tube feed or because we're unwilling to tube feed and say, well, there's probably something wrong with him. I'm just going to let him die really isn't very fair because this little kid had nothing else wrong with him other than he had no ability to suckle effectively and compete with his brother at the nipple. So with some tube feeding and a little bit of supportive care, this is the quality of dog that we per were able to turn out. So all you need for supplies are going to be the formula, and we recommend the Breeder's Edge Foster Care, a feeding tube, a syringe to put the feeding tube or put the formula in and hook up to the feeding tube, a marker so that you have a place to put a mark on the tube so you know how far to pass it, a rectal thermometer to make sure the puppy is warm enough, and then a scale that measures in grams and ounces so that you know how much to feed this puppy. So essential supplies, this is your little bundle here for what you need. So grab your camera, take a picture. If you miss it, then again, this is on our website so that you can find the tube feeding information. So why should we feed this formula instead of using goat's milk? Because I've always heard that goat's milk or cow's milk is just fine. And the answer is it's not. The fat and carbohydrate contents are different. Protein content contents are different in dog, cow, cat, and um, goat. So make sure that you're using a formula that's appropriate for the dog. It also has amino acids in it that will reduce the risk of developing cataracts. It also has some um, psyllium in it to make them have less diarrhea. There's just a lot of things that are really important. So again, this is your feeding schedule. And um, again, this just shows us that the um, risk of having puppies that don't do well if they're not supplemented is great. So don't be afraid to feed these guys. You're not gonna suppress their ability to eat. So again, no one should starve to death. I raise corgis, um, no one should starve to death. There's a lot of reasons that we leave, lose puppies, but starvation should not be one of them. Weighing can be a little bit challenging as the puppies get bigger. So. I learned this little trick from a friend who puts the puppies in a mesh bag. You can get these at the store in the laundry department. You zip the little kid into the bag and then use a fish scale. When I say a fish scale, I mean the scale you weigh fish on, not the scales on a fish. So weigh the puppy in the bag if the puppy's too wiggly to sit on your scale. And this is a very effective way to um, measure the puppy's weight. Don't forget if you've fed them that you also need to stimulate them to urinate and defecate. Now, next we're going to have the GI tract. 
So anytime we're feeding, we want to make sure that our puppies are getting the most out of their formula. And we see a lot of puppies with diarrhea. The GI tract, the intestinal tract should be sterile at birth. There's no bacteria already in it, but it very rapidly colonizes with um, bacteria from the bitch and her environment. So using a probiotic, we have this new product called Nurture Flora that has all the probiotics in it that we want for our little babies. And it comes in a, a nice thick paste that's kind of a molasses based. So you can just put a little dab on their tongue and they can very easily swallow this. And by doing so, we can make sure that we're getting the right bacteria into their GI tract so that we have minimal effects of diarrhea. It's normal for meconium, which is the first fetal stool to be passed in the first 48 hours. And after that, we should see the stools being pasty and kind of a yellow color that looks a little seedy. It's got some kind of little specks in it that look like seeds, absolutely normal. And by the time the puppies are weaned, the stools should be formed, meaning that when you go to pick them up, you should be able to pick them up in tall grass without it being messy. All right, eliminations. Um, puppies don't urinate def or defecate voluntarily for the first 18 to 21 days. Overfeeding, we can see the stools becoming yellow or green and watery. If we see a foamy bright yellow stool, that may be a sign of canine herpes. That's not the only time that we see yellow foamy stools, but that is one concern. If we see blood tinged stools, blood in the stool, that may mean that they either have coccidia or sepsis and they can have coccidia at a remarkably early age. So if you are seeing problems with diarrhea, we recommend that you take a stool sample into your veterinary clinic to be tested both on fecal flotation, looking at it um, for the eggs, and then ELISA testing to look for the uh, proteins that we see in Giardia and some of the other uh, parasites. So uh, Antec and IDEX labs have an amazing profile that they can do on a fecal sample with even a very small quantity. So if you're struggling with diarrhea, please make sure that you're finding out exactly what the cause of it is so we can appropriately treat the puppies. Third is keeping our puppies warm. And we want to make sure that they're keeping warm with a heat source from underneath. I don't ever use a heat lamp. I don't ever use heat from above. I think heating from underneath is best. Puppies prefer a temperature gradient, meaning that they can pick where they want to be. This is my litter of 10 corgi puppies. You can see half of them are on the heating disc and the other half have moved off because they were warm enough. The advantage of this is puppies can move around. They can decide how warm they want to be, how cool they want to be. It gives them the option, but we're not overheating the bitch, which can happen if you're heating the room too much, if the room is too hot, or if you're using heat lamp where the bitch can't escape from those temperatures. And she may not want to be in with the puppies when it's too warm. On the side of this box, you can see that there's a rheostat so I can adjust the temperature of the nest. Now we have other options. The puppy warmer system is our incubator system and our oxygen concentrator. Ken Sundan has developed some really superior products for these purposes for keeping the puppies warm, especially right after birth or if you have sick puppies and then delivering oxygen to them if they need additional support. If they have pneumonia or they're not thriving, getting them in a warm oxygen rich environment is very helpful to supportive care of these guys. So puppies that lay out long or maybe even roll, roll onto their back are very warm, comfortable puppies. If they're curled up in a C shape or they're piled on top of each other, these are puppies that are cold. And like I said, puppies like that temperature gradient. So they're gonna move around and they're gonna pick the spot that they are most comfortable in, but we want to give them only good choices. We never wanna give them a place that they can get off to that's too cold, that they end up isolated from the rest of the litter. So we wanna only give good choices to our puppies. Why don't I use a heat lamp? Well. Years ago, when my daughter was in 4-H, we almost set our barn on fire with a heat lamp. Fortunately, it was a Friday in the afternoon, and our neighbor came over and knocked on our door and said, um, you, have a, you have a problem? And our um, daughter's uh, calf hutch that the calf was in, named Medusa, melted down to the ground. Instead of it being four feet tall, it ended up about eight inches tall with the fire. Fortunately, Medusa survived, and the rest of the barn survived. But there's some huge risks, and I've seen too many times that heat lamps have caused fires, overheating, dangers to the puppies and dangers to the bitch. Weaning, of course, is really important once we get to about the third to the fifth week, depending on the breed of the puppy. Now, this is a litter of collie puppies that are 12 days old, and I normally don't wean this early, but these little kids' um, mother had mastitis and she wasn't able to adequately produce milk for them at this point. They are 12 days old, their eyes aren't even open yet. So we put the puppy warmer or the puppy starter moose, otherwise known as puppy crack, onto this really flat corral plate, put the noses up over the edge of the plate. And you can see that even though their eyes aren't open, now they're not very neat about it, they're crawling through the food, but they were even at 12 days of age, figuring out how to start swallowing food. So the puppy formula starter mousse by Royal Canaan is an amazing weaning diet, can be really useful for our bitches that aren't eating well. We can top dress our food with it. 
if we wanted to drink better, you can open a can of it and uh, stir it into her uh, water drinking bucket, or you can start winning your puppies onto this as early as 12 days if necessary. Other formulas that we like as well, when we start moving on into a formula that they need for a more long-term maintenance diet would be either the Purina puppy or the Yukonuba Royal Canaan puppy diets. These are the ones that have DHA in them. These are the ones that are really great for a good stool character, really great nutrition. And these are the two formulas that we recommend feeding. Sometimes we forget about water. This is number five. Water is our most important nutrient because we don't really think about it sometimes. But as soon as the puppies are two and a half to three and a half weeks old, I start introducing water. Now it should be in something that's shallow enough that the puppies aren't going to fall in. I had one puppy that fell into a bucket years ago. Um, her name ended up to be Splash because she did survive. But I like them in a nice, shallow, heavy dish that doesn't tip over. This is a a, just a Pyrex pie, pie plate that works really well for puppies to have the water introduced in. The other is a chicken waterer. Um, these work really well for outside when I put my puppies out in the yard and they need some place to drink. Then they also don't lay in it and swim in it because it's a much more shallow and narrow kind of chamber, but it keeps the leaves and the dirt and the sticks and all the other things out. And it gives my puppies access to water. So these are really great tools to do. So don't forget to give your guys water. The other thing that I like a lot is to use the Lixit type water bottles. You can set them on the side of an X-Pen or the side of a crate. You can set it up in uh, a stand that this is one that somebody designed and built themselves. But these Lixit bottles, again, allow puppies access to water free choice without having it to be messy or someplace that they're going to um, fall in, swim in, um, have stools in. It's just a nice, clean way to provide water. Now, some puppies don't learn this as fast as others. So I usually put something like chicken baby food on the tip of this nipple so that the puppies will find the water and start licking it at the chicken baby food and then say, oh, wow, this is pretty cool. I can get a drink this way. So parasite control, I think it's really important we talk about it. This is how I feel about parasites. This is how I feel about raw meat diets. I don't know that I can say much more other than they're pretty disgusting and I would prefer not kissing a pig. So I would also prefer that you don't have parasites. So what can we do about those? So the most common worms that we see in dogs are going to be roundworms, hookworms, heartworm, whipworm, and tapeworms, with other parasites being giardia and coccidia, one-celled parasites. Roundworms can look like this. They'll look like spaghetti. They are the most common intestinal worm we see in dogs. Hookworms are much smaller than that. They can be very difficult to see with the naked eye, but they have these nasty little teeth that allow them to attach the lining of the intestine and attach suck blood. This is where the anemia comes from, is that they, they'll actually suck blood out of the puppies. Um, it'll pass through the worm's intestinal tract and then come out of the uh, puppy as a bloody or dark stool. How do our dogs get roundworms? Well, they're typically a fecal oral route, meaning that the dog ingests those parasites by eating little creatures like um, field mice and earthworms. And then once the dog has those, the um, parasite will insist in the muscles of the dog and the stress of pregnancy and lactation will reactivate the migration of those. And then they can pass through the placenta and into the puppy. So puppies can be born with roundworms on this mechanism. Why do we have a little kid in this picture? Well, because children can get either ocular larval migraines, which means a migrating uh, parasite that goes through the eye of the child, or they can go through the liver called visceral larval migraines. And we can have our children or other people who are immunosuppressed or immunocompromised get sick from these roundworms. So it's really important that we're doing good intestinal parasite control, not only for the health of our dogs, but for the health of the people in the environment. Hookworms are similar, that, that is fecal oral, but instead of passing through the placenta, they pass through the milk and into the puppies. So again, we wanna be very careful with this. Now, in some parts of the country, they're starting to see some resistance to heartworms. So some of the parasites are not responding to the typical dewormers. So uh, that's something that you need to work with your local veterinarian on if that's the case. What do we see for symptoms of roundworms? Diarrhea, weight loss. You can see roundworms in the vomit or in the stool, an unthrifty looking coat and a pot bellied appearance to the dog. They'll just look unthrifty. Hookworms are very similar, except that we do see anemia with those as, long, uh, as, as well as vomiting, diarrhea, and pot bellied appearance. Now you can see the worms directly sometimes. Those are what roundworms look like. Under the microscope, we can see the eggs. And then there is an ELISA test for this. If those samples are sent out to Antec or IDEX, one of the diagnostic labs, the veterinary clinics do not have ELISA tests in-house for roundworms. Hookworms, again, we can see the eggs under the microscope. You'll typically not see the worms themselves or an ELISA test if the sample is sent out. And then we have the wicked 
were dreaded Giardia and Coccidia. Now in this picture, Giardia looks super cute. It's purple. It's really a cute looking little parasite. They're one-celled parasites. We can't see them with the naked eye. Um, and they're even really difficult for us to see under the microscope. So they are a really nasty little parasite. And unfortunately, many places that have large groups of dogs, whether it's a commercial breeding kennel or a, just a home breeding kennel, um, Human, Humane Society rescues any of these organizations that have large groups of dogs will frequently have Giardia and Coccidia. Giardia, again, is transmitted through the feces and back into the dog, but rarely do we see Giardia in humans caused by dog Giardia. We used to say that it was all one species, but now that we have ELISA testing, we know that rarely do dog and human Giardia share with each other. Typically dog is dog and human is human. Humans get Giardia, but not dog Giardia in most cases. Coccidia, again, is a fecal oral route. Again, they're one cell parasites, so you can't see them. And the symptoms of Giardia and Coccidia are going to be very much the same. Sick dog, doesn't feel good, bad diarrhea, just bleh, they don't feel well. Giardia, however, can be tested for in the office at the veterinary clinic if you either look under the microscope and see the cysts, which, like I said, are hard to see, or there is an ELISA test that can be run in the vet clinic for telling you if you have Giardia or not. The problem with the ELISA test is it's such a good test that it will stay positive for an extended period of time after the Giardia is cleared up and gone. And even when we talk to the company who makes the test, they cannot tell us if the Giardia test is positive because they used to have Giardia or if they still have it and it's testing positive. So if you're sending puppies out the door and you're getting phone calls from people that they're saying, well, I've taken my dog to the vet, the stools are normal, but the cyst, the test says that the dog has Giardia and they didn't see cysts, they just saw the ELISA test is positive. That may not mean an active infection. It may mean that that infection has been cleared up and it's still a residue test being positive. So treatment success is resolution of diarrhea, meaning the stools are formed, not that the test becomes negative. Coccidia, we don't have an ELISA test for in office at this point, and we can see a variety of different kinds of uh, coccidia under the microscope. Sometimes it's hard to tell rabbit or bird uh, coccidia from dog coccidia. Our diagnostic labs can usually tell us the difference. So again, a coccidia positive test may not mean that the dog has a parasite of the dog, it may be that they ate rabbit droppings or bird droppings, and they're seeing coccidia cysts under the microscope. So this is where sending the test out to a diagnostic lab is really useful because those technicians can tell the difference. I'm not that good. How do we prevent Giardia? Really important. Number one is bathe your bitches before she whelps. Please shave up her tail, you know, wrap her tail, do something so that she's not dragging soft stools in, give her a good bath so she doesn't have fecal material on her. Keep the stools out in the kennel in the yard picked up so that it's as clean as possible. You can use a disinfectant, which will help, but it's not going to completely eliminate Giardia. Fenbendazole before and before whelping and during lactation will prevent the passage of those cysts in the stool, but Giardia does not come through the placenta. Giardia does not come through the milk. So it's not a foolproof treatment. It's just the best you can do to reduce the number of cysts in her stool, which will reduce the likelihood that she passes that on through her puppies getting in the stool. So if she comes in from outside with stool on her feet or on her tail, she may end up having the puppies crawl through that and then ingest the, the uh, cysts and end up with Giardia. We used to, a few years ago, have a vaccine for Giardia, but that's been off the market for a, a while. So we don't have a way to vaccinate. And we do not recommend the use of metronidazole during pregnancy or before the puppies are six weeks old. So using fenbendazole is going to be your best treatment that is safe during pregnancy and lactation. Me uh, metronidazole is not. Toxidia, very similar. Bathe her before she whelps. Keep the stools picked up. Again, it doesn't come through the placenta or the milk. And we cannot use Albon or sulfonamide similar to that during pregnancy or when the puppies are under four weeks of age. So be really careful with that. Albon during pregnancy can cause midline defects, meaning cleft palates, open abdominal walls, um, really devastating midline defects in the puppy. So do not use Albon during pregnancy. Giardia, we only treat if the puppies are symptomatic. So if the puppies have Giardia positive uh, ELISA tests, but you don't see cysts and the puppies don't have diarrhea, I don't treat. Benbendazole, of course, is our drug of choice for that. You can bathe them every day. You can use metronidazole after they're six weeks old. And I don't recommend the compounded pro product that's a combination of metronidazole and fenbendazole because we may be treating for things that we don't really need. Rarely will I, I pull out secnitazole. 
Um, on rare occasion, I will use that, but only if fenbendazole and metronidazole fail, and that's not most of the time. Coccidia, uh, I recommend the use of Albon liquid or tablets, depending on the size of the puppy. There is no Totrazeril approved product in the United States. None, zero for any species, not for cows, not for horses, not for dogs, not for any species. Can you buy Totrazeril online? Yes, you can. And if you look up the address for the people who are selling that, I looked it up last week. It's a UPS station in Orlando, Florida. If you think you have an adverse event to Tartrazeril and you lose puppies or dogs to Tartrazeril, you have no course of action against that company because their address is the UPS station. They're not there to help you. Can you buy it? Yes, you can. Should you buy it? Absolutely not. If you have a problem with coccidia and you can't get it treated appropriately with five to seven days of Albon, then you may need panazeril, which is an equine product, but those big tubes are meant to treat a 1500 pound horse and not a little dog. So the medication inside the tube is not uniformly distributed. So I don't recommend panazeril unless it's compounded by a compounding pharmacy. And I never, ever, ever recommend trazeril because you have nobody to help you. Now, I have people tell me that they don't think Albon works. They don't think fenbendazole works. They don't think Nemex and Strongid always work. And I'm going to give you some tips here on how to make those medications work better. Number one, use your scale and weigh your puppies so you know exactly what they weigh. Don't hold the puppy and say, I think she's about three pounds because you may have a two pound puppy and a five pound puppy in the same litter. So weigh each puppy and dose it according to the label dose. Number three is when you get that product, shake it really well when the bottle is new and then pour it into smaller bottles. We have these amber bottles on our website. Uh, so shake it up and put it into smaller bottles for two reasons. One is it keeps the product more uniformly distributed. They're really thick products. They're like paint. It settles out in the bottom. So put it into smaller bottles so it's more uniformly distributed when you shake it up. And number two, that gives you less airspace, headspace in the bottle. So the product stays fresh longer. Avoid the equine pastes used directly. Um, I use the large animal suspension, but not the pastes, the paste in the tubes. Make sure you're picking up all the organic material, meaning feces in the yard, in the kennel. Keep things as clean as you possibly can and follow disinfectant instructions. Use the right dilution, use the right rinsing, follow the directions. Now, disinfectants won't kill these uh, parasites, but removing the organic material with detergent to get everything clean and then disinfecting will at least eliminate some of the other problems that you may have because the overall health of the puppy's GI tract is dependent on not having bad bacteria, not having parasites, not having all the other things that can predispose them to things like parvovirus. So we can have puppies that are a little bit more resistant to developing parvo and other diseases if their GI tract is healthy with good probiotics, good nutrition, good parasite control and good disinfecting. Those are absolutely key to keeping our puppies healthy. So I'm gonna show you a model parasite control product, a program that Dr. Katz from the, um, Indiana has worked really hard on developing. So this is how to vaccinate and how to do your parasite control to reduce the risks of your puppies becoming sick. Number one is fenbendazole can be used safely during pregnancy to reduce the parasites that are migrating through causing roundworms or to reduce the hookworms that come through the milk. So you can use fenbendazole very safely, the 10% equine or large animal product, uh, shake it up really well. It's one CC for four pounds of body weight, or you can use the granules, not the paste, into your bitches from the time she's 42 days pregnant until the puppies are two weeks old. So this will allow you to not have to worry about roundworms and hookworms in the puppies when they are babies. You don't have to deworm if you do this protocol. Our deworming schedule, if you haven't done fenbendazole, is you can start parental PAMA weight, which is NEMAX, at one week of age. You do that once a week, one day a week, for um, weekly until the puppies are six weeks old. At six weeks, you can give a five-day course of fenbendazole that will get all your intestinal parasites, except for coccidia. It'll do giardia, roundworms, hookworms, whipworms. And then at eight weeks, you can start them on their monthly heartworm preventive. So that can be uh, revolution or revolt, that can be heart guard, that can be interceptor, that can be sentinel, that can be Iverheart. All those products are fine to give every four weeks if the puppy is over eight weeks old and over four pounds. And then halfway in between those monthly doses, you can give Nemex or Strongid to help with your parasite control. 
you have to do those at least every two weeks because the life cycle of roundworms and hookworms is three weeks long. And if you deworm only every four weeks, then every three weeks, those eggs turn into worms that turn into mature worms that make more eggs. And so you're going to have this vicious cycle of parasites unless you do this protocol that you're deworming every two weeks. I use Nemex for my little babies under 10 pounds of age or 10 pounds of weight because I don't like using Strongid on the little babies. Strongid is fine. It's a large animal product. It's a suspension, not a paste. Strongid is fine for puppies over 10 pounds, but I personally think that puppies under 10 pounds are too hard to weigh and accurately dose. So my dose for Nemex under 10 pounds is one cc per two pounds of body weight. So if the puppy's two pounds, they get one cc. If they're four pounds, they get two cc's. Do the math. And then for Strongid, it's one cc per 20 pounds of body weight. Some people say 10. It's safe. You can do that. So one cc for a 10 pound puppy, two cc's for a 20 pound puppy and so on. So again, giving these every two weeks or alternating with the oral heartworm medication that also contains parental PAMA weight. Um, HeartGuard has it, Interceptor has it, Sentinel has it, Iverheart has it. A lot of the products have those built into the heartworm preventives. So you get intestinal parasite control along with heartworm control. At the time that the puppies are ready to leave, the last five days that you're there at your house, you should be giving fenbendazole. So they leave without roundworms, hookworms, giardia. And then I give three days of Albon just before they leave and three days in their new house. So a total of six days so that we stabilize the intestinal bacteria, reducing the risk of parvovirus. Yes, parvo is a virus. Yes, Albon's an antibiotic. Uh, antibiotics don't work on viruses, but it gets back to GI health. So if our puppies have a good, steady, formed stool, they've got no water change, no food change, and all these great things are happening, they are much more resistant to parvo even if they're exposed to it. So that's our protocol for our puppies. For our pregnant dams, either fenbendazole, or if you haven't done fenbendazole, then you need to start deworming our puppies. When the puppies are eight weeks and older, you can go to Revolution, Selamectin, that's Revolt, one of those products, and then Strongid or Nemex. So those are all fine. For our adult dogs in the kennel, either the males or the females that are not pregnant, you can do your tapeworm control with Sentinel Spectrum, Iverheart Max, and then your flea and tick product should be, if you're using an oral, only Brevecto. So Brevecto is the only oral flea and tick medication other than Revolution that's labeled for flea and tick control. Simperica, Credelio, and Nexgard are not labeled for use in breeding animals. Nobody has researched it. Nobody knows whether that's going to be safe or not. So if you're using an oral flea and tick product, make sure you're using Brevecto. Coccidia and Giardia for dogs that are not pregnant, you don't need to routinely put them on any medication unless they have soft stools and they have a positive test for Giardia and or Coccidia. If they're clinically normal, and if you see just a few Giardia, I don't treat every one of those dogs. That's impossible to completely clear up, and that's not going to ever get rid of it in your kennel. Vaccines, another really important topic. So distemper and lepto, we're going to talk about these individually. The distemper-lepto combination is distemper, adeno, parainfluenza, and parvo. What is distemper? Distemper is a virus that causes GI signs like vomiting and diarrhea and pneumonia, runny nose. Um, the prognosis for dogs that get distemper is very poor. Most of those dogs die, even with supportive care. It's pretty serious. If they do survive, they end up sometimes with Symptoms like seizures, it can be pretty bad. So we want to avoid distemper at all, at, at all costs. So vaccinating is a very effective way to do that. Parvo, again, very common. We see that mostly in our young puppies that are not adequately vaccinated yet because they're not old enough to have completed the series. Even if they've been vaccinated, sometimes they fall through the cracks and they still end up with parvo. So symptoms are bloody diarrhea and vomiting. Prognosis used to be pretty poor. But we have a new product on the market made by Alanco. It's an IV injection of a frozen product. It needs to be given by a veterinarian. It is not something that you can pick up and treat yourself at home. It's an intravenous dose. And although it's a little pricey, it is a monoclonal A antibody, absolutely a game changer. The puppy survival rate with Parvo with this new Alanco product is huge. So if you think you have Parvo, 
or you think your puppies have been exposed to Parvo, contact your veterinarian immediately and get them to order the product if they don't already have it in their freezer so that you can go ahead and get them treated. Lepto, leptospirosis is a bacterial infection, distemper and Parvo are viruses. It's a bacterial infection that causes usually kidney problems and liver problems. Sometimes puppies and dogs die from this. It can be pretty serious. The big concern with lepto is people can get it too. So again, the prognosis can be pretty good if you diagnose it and get the puppy on antibiotics, but be really careful if you think you have lepto. The dogs can become jaundiced. They can go into kidney failure. But if you think you have lepto, you need to be careful that you don't get it. So wear gloves, be careful when you clean up urine, be aware that this is a bacterial disease that spreads to people. Bordetella, there's a three-way Bordetella vaccination. The intranasal one is the one I prefer. There is an oral vaccine, but it's not as effective against what we can prevent. So Bordetella includes in the vaccine, the three-way, Bordetella, adenovirus, and parainfluenza. So again, using that three-way product will significantly reduce respiratory disease in the kennel. Kennel cough is the symptom that goes with Bordetella. So any kind of cough, sneezing, runny eyes, runny nose, any of those things that's contagious um, can be a problem. Generally, the prognosis is very good. We rarely see dogs that get sick enough with Bordetella, parainfluenza, or adenovirus to die from it. So it's typically supportive care to prevent the cough and use an antibiotic. Influenza, there's a two-way, um, this is not correct, there's a two-way influenza product, and that is um, H3N2 and H3N8, and there is a vaccine on the market now um, available. It's not readily available, but we did see a big influenza outbreak this fall, September and October from the West Coast moving through the entire country. Again, the symptoms can be a pretty severe cough. We do see some dogs that can die from this because it does cause hemorrhagic pneumonia. And if you're in an area where there's a lot of respiratory disease, I would definitely recommend that you vaccinate for influenza. It's a series of two vaccinations the first year with an annual booster. How do you decide what products you're gonna use? We recommend that you use quality products, Zoetis, Merck, Elanco, Boring Ingelheim, any of those products are great products. We recommend that you keep them refrigerated. Don't let them get so cold in your refrigerator that they freeze because we do see some pretty nasty reactions. Um, the uh, puppy in this picture is a puppy that was vaccinated over the right shoulder. And you can see the caliper, that orange thing is around the lump that developed from the puppy's injection site. Every now and then that happens. If it happens, it's really a good idea to know exactly where you vaccinate. We don't recommend the back of the neck. We recommend over the shoulder so that we can keep track of where it is and that you're always giving the same vaccination in the same place so that if there is an adverse event, you can report it to Revival, report it to the company. If the products are outdated, please don't use them. They're not going to be effective. And if you're storing refrigerator, the vaccine in your refrigerator, don't put it on the door of the refrigerator, store it in the back of the refrigerator because every time you open and close the door to the fridge, that temperature changes on that vaccine. So that's not going to allow the vaccine to be as strong as efficacious. You don't want to vaccinate more often than every three weeks because you actually suppress the immune system. So don't do that and be attentive to outbreaks. So if you hear there's influenza, if you hear there's Bordetella, if you hear there's Lyme disease, Lepto, anything like that going around, Parvo, make sure that all your dogs are current on their vaccinations. Talk to your vet to see if you need to step up your vaccination program. Now, for some people, they're reluctant to do too many vaccinations. So doing a nomogram is a blood test that you can vac that you can draw on the female, the mother, and you can, from that information, know what her antibody level was. And from that, you can decide when the puppies need to be vaccinated. It's really cool. Um, it's, to my knowledge, only run with a nomogram. There's a lot of labs that run the titers to tell you what the bitch's vaccination status is, but it doesn't tell you how to vaccinate your puppies. So their distemper and their parvo are the two things we can test for. And we know that that number declines 50% every two weeks. So by testing them, we can then calculate exactly when the puppy needs to have a vaccination protocol uh, given. So you can standardize it, you can customize it to each puppy. Lori Larson's lab is the CAVID lab at the University of Wisconsin. So you can send your samples there and you, you can look that up and have that paperwork taken to your veterinarian. Like I said, the Alanco product is Kind 030. It's an intravenous product can be given if the very worst thing happens and you have Parvo. Heaven help you if you do, but be aware that this is a product that's now on the market. Nomograms, this is where you send the sample to the diagnostic lab. This is the address. If you go to the website, bring up the 
um, requisition form, take it to your vet clinic, ask them to fill it out, mark the little box that says you want a nomogram, not just a titer, but a nomogram on your bitch. Then Dr. Larson will interpret the results and tell you how to customize your vaccination program. This is the website link for it. Do the legwork for your vet. If you're interested in doing this, don't make your vet go to all the trouble to do this. You can very easily go to this website, look it up, take the paperwork in. Your vet tech will love you for this. Then they don't have to do the extra work. So important that we're vaccinating appropriately, important that you have your puppies ready to go with their microchips, with their vaccines, with all their records. So make sure you get all that together before the puppies are ready to leave. I love sending puppies out microchips so I know where they end up. Um, hygiene, very important that we are using appropriate hygiene in our kennels. So antibiotics are not enough to overcome a problem with poor hygiene. So you need to keep the place clean. You need to wash your hands before and after you handle the puppies. You need to wear footwear that's washable like these shoes. Um, you need to wear clothing that's washable. If you have sick dogs in your kennel, do the healthy dogs first and the sick dogs last so you're not spreading shoes and clothes with those bacteria and viruses back into the kennel where the healthy dogs are. Use soap and water to wash your hands. Use soap to clean your kennel. You need more than just an alcohol-based product. You need to break down the organic material with a detergent or a soap and then clean your hands, clean the kennel. And then of course, the problem is we also have to balance the amount of socialization with isolating our puppies. And it's a delicate balance to say, when are the puppies safe to be exposed to other people, to people that are outside in the real world so that they can start to understand what social skills are. Uh, I want to throw this in at the end. This is a little off, but umbilical cords, very important place for bacteria to ascend into the puppy. So as soon as the puppy is born, you want to um, make sure that the cord is stopped bleeding. And then you want to start dipping the cord immediately after birth, at birth at two hours, and then three times a day until the cord falls off. And by using the clean cut, which is a tincture of iodine product, we can keep these puppies from ending up with an infection that goes up the umbilical cord and into the abdomen. And when I say dip the cord, I literally mean dip the cord. This is a little kid that we're gonna put the umbilical cord right into the bottle, tip the puppy over and make sure that that nice ring of tincture of alcohol or a tincture of iodine, which is alcohol and um, iodine mixed together, seals that cord and keeps bacteria from ascending into the abdomen. These are our cord care products that we have. We have clips. We have a special pair of scissors that we can cut the cord with after it's clamped. And we, we then have the clean cut product. Why do we do that? Well, this is a puppy that died from a, an umbilical infection. This puppy's cord was being dipped in chlorhexidine, not tincture of iodine. This puppy was fine at two in the morning, was dead at four in the morning, I know, because it was my puppy. Um, and you can see that the um, intestines are very inflamed and you can see those big white flecks of things. That's fibrin. That's an infection in the puppy's abdomen. So you can prevent this from having happening in your kennel by using the tincture of iodine products. Elimination training is our last step to keeping our puppies clean. I use in my kennel, um, in my situation, I use paint pans with Marth um, equine bedding. It's a pretty effective way to do it. You can give these litter boxes to the puppies at around three weeks of age. The puppies very quickly migrate to these and start to learn to eliminate in the tray. Um, the girls do a great job of urine and stools. The boys do a pretty good job with stools, but they tend to put their front feet in the tray and kind of urinate right along the edge. So I do put a pad underneath it. Um, so having those litter boxes a very effective way to keep the puppies clean. They aren't sleeping in stool. They're not laying in urine. Um, underneath my puppies, there's a mesh bath mat so the urine can run through if they mix the box. And then the stools are off to the side. I usually put this box as far from the door that I walk into the uh, room or the kennel with so that the puppies don't run through it when I come over to see you come into the room. So put it as far away as you can. And the puppies very quickly, most puppies will migrate to this product. There's also a product called Brilliant Pad, which is another way to housebreak puppies. This is a little pad that's on a roll and it's activated by the puppy going on and then stepping back off. And then that rolls up the fecal material into this really neat pad. So there's a couple of really nice tools on the market that you can use to keep your puppies clean. So we have our neonatal feeding bundle for how to get our puppies off to a good start. We have our nurture bundle for their um, probiotics. We have the umbilical cord bundle, and then we have the vaccination and microchip bundle. Then we have the fun stuff, the toys, the things that we really want them to play with or be comfortable with. We have our Breeders' Edge products for improved fertility and better lactation uh, in our bitches. 
Again, we have a number of different products in these bundles that Shelly's put together for us. So we have nice, effective ways for you to remember to buy all the products that you need. So instead of buying one item at a time, you've got a project solution. So it's a nice way for us to be able to get all these products together for you. For your whelping supply and equipment list, um, this is my list of things that I want you to have on hand. Um, we don't sell bratwurst and ice cream at Revival. You have to buy your own, your own oatmeal, your own tablecloths. But we have a lot of these products on the uh, list here so that you have them available to you. And then our drug and uh, medical supply list, which is a little bit more sophisticated. Some of these are prescription drugs like vitamin K, um, Dopram. These are prescription items. Some of these are over-the-counter products. So these are all the things that I want you to have together when you get ready to have your puppies so that at the last minute, you're not running out trying to figure out how to get these supplies if you end up with a problem or a situation. Again, we have the repro books, the canine reproduction and neonatology book, and then your pandemic puppy book. Um, we wrote that during the pandemic so that people that are buying puppies, and I don't let anybody buy a puppy from me until they've read this book. So they understand housebreaking. It's got all the new protocols for vaccinations, for heartworm, for flea and tick, the new protocols for spaying and neutering later. All that information is in there. Um, these books run very inexpensively and they save so much time when you're selling puppies that you're not having to go over and over and over those materials or copy off pieces of paper and sticking them into a notebook for people to take home with them. So having these resources available, I just have these people buy a book and then they're ready to go when they come get a puppy. Okay. So first Q&A here. Um, somebody's just, Len is wondering, what is APGAR? I know you've talked about that in other webinars before. Do you want to talk about that? The APGAR is a scoring system of whether the puppy's breathing, has a heartbeat, what their mo mo um, activity is. Uh, so you can score them any between a zero and a 10 and get an idea what numerically their health is. So again, go back to our section number one, uh, set one on the first breath, and that goes through a lot of detail on that. Okay. Um, Donna's wondering, she's a, a foster rescue and they get moms that are pregnant or just had pups from shelters. And she said before they come, some vets are vaccinating while they're pregnant or nursing. And she's wondering, is that okay? She was told it wasn't a good yeah. idea. And she's just wondering what effects this can have on the puppies. Sure. Um, so during pregnancy, it's not recommended that we vaccinate because if we do have an adverse event, it can negatively affect the pregnancy. During nursing, it's probably not a bad idea. And in rescue situations, it's always a lot more difficult to manage these. Um, Somebody is wondering, when should you worry about shunts and what can be done for puppies that are determined or suspected to have shunts? So there's a blood test called a bile acid that we do. Um, typically, we have the puppy fasting, draw a blood sample, feed them. Two hours later, draw a second blood sample. That'll tell us if they have a shunt. We run the bile acid paired sample on it. Uh, shunts on occasion can be surgically corrected either with a coil or with surgery. They're not very common, but they're pretty serious. So if you have a puppy that either has seizures or seems slow developmentally, seems a little dull, then those are tests that you can have your veterinary clinic run for you. Okay. Um, somebody's wondering, how can you estimate the adult weight of a puppy? If you know the parent size, that's the best way to know. What's mom, what's dad? And when you breed a large dog to a small dog, you don't get middle-sized dogs, you get big dogs and little dogs. So it depends on which one they take after, mom or dad. You can't always predict. Uh, Cindy's wondering, does the firstborn generally have better immunities due to possibly getting more colostrum or just the last being the last puppy born or like, how does that work? Sometimes um, they do get better colostrum because they're the first one out. So that's where plasma can play an important role. If you have a litter of 16 puppies and you think the last six didn't get enough colostrum, then plasma can be a substitute for that. Um, and that needs to be fresh frozen plasma from another dog. There is no colostrum oral product that you can buy on the market. It has to be plasma. Okay. Uh, Shannon says a puppy rectum is so tiny and the thermometer is so big. Any tips there? <laughs> well, first of all, the size of the poop is big enough that you can put any size rectal thermometer in there. Those digital ones are no longer that scary. Um, okay. Nicole is wondering, is tube feeding via oral or nasogastric? You put it in the oral cavity. The nose is too small, so it slides down over the tongue. Okay. And then another tube feeding question. When you tube feed, do you fill the syringe with the tube on or off? And what about adding air to the stomach? Anything? Yeah. 
So I fill the tube before I put the tube down the puppy. I have the syringe hooked up to it because I'm usually there by myself. And if you try to hook it up, you're trying to hold the tube, hold the puppy, hold the syringe. It doesn't go very well. So I hook it up in advance and then I'll put just a little tiny bubble of air at the end. So I'll hold the syringe. The bubble of air goes in very last. So you push all the formula into the puppy. And I normally don't burp puppies, even if they get a little tiny bit of air in their tummy, they're okay. Okay. We have time for about one more question here. So um, Patty's wondering, do you have a favorite heating mat and what temperature should you use for a heating pad? Like 95 or hundred, what, what temperature should that heating mat be? Yeah, that's a great question. And normally I don't use the regular human heating pads. They can have hot spots and overheat. There's a lot of irregularities. If you go to Ken Sundin's website, Puppy Warmer, you can see some of the risks that go with that. There'll be hot spots and cool spots. It, it's not uniform and many of them have an automatic shutoff. So they don't stay on for an extended period of time. There are whelping nests on the market. We carry one at Revival that has a heater in it. Um, they're very uniform. They're really well constructed. They used to be made by the T.E. Scott company, they stopped making them. Um, we do see some that also operate instead of on electricity, will operate on alternative sources like a battery, like a, a car battery or propane for people that don't have electricity or don't have electricity as an option if they have an outage. So there are really good products on the market. If you Google search heated whelping nest, you'll find some companies that make them. Um, not a fan of heating pads for long-term use, not a fan of hot uh, heat lamps, for all those reasons that we've talked about. Okay. Well, sounds good. Well, I know we still have a ton more questions, um, but I we know, are, are out of time, but please call our pet care pros. Um, they know the answers to a lot of these. And if they don't know, they will call Dr. Greer and, and get the answer from her. Um, again, a lot of resources were mentioned today. Check that out in our learning center. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, this webinar, along with a lot of our other uh, education resources will be added there. And there's that text message sign up if you haven't already. Again, information delivered right to your phone and write that number down. It's a great resource. Our pet care pros, I'm always amazed with how much they know. So make sure, write that number down, 800-786-4751. Give them a call if your question was not answered today. Thank you so much for joining us today. We appreciate you joining us and have a great rest of your day. Bye everybody. Hi, if you're watching on YouTube, consider subscribing to the Revival Animal Health YouTube channel. If you have a pet health question, call our pet care pros at this number and don't miss our other pet health videos.